Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your blessings and the grace that is renewed this morning in our lives. We pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. On your worksheet, you have uh, two interesting structures. First, you have a chiasm that centers or focuses in uh, this now well-known expression, she is my sister. Who used that expression? Abraham used it twice. Once in chapter 12 with Pharaoh and then with Abimelech. But this time it's not Abraham, it is Isaac. Funny thing, he uses the same statement, she's my sister. What is interesting is that uh, this expression, she's my sister, and the whole story around it, is the focal point of a chiasm that starts in chapter 25 and ends in chapter 28. And uh, this section here is in chapter 26. For you to be able to see that this really is the center of a chiasm, I put there the whole structure. It's a structure that starts with Isaac, the seed of Abraham, taking wife from Bethel's house. Who's Bethel? Bethel is his, Isaac's, what? Is the son of Nahor, Nahor being Abraham's brother. Okay? So that means that Rebecca is what to Isaac? She is the daughter of his cousin. Second cousin or something like that. If you go all the way to the end of that chiastic structure, you will see that Jacob, the seed of Isaac, is sent to Bethel, same place, same people in order to find a wife again when you have the same kind of move you suspect hey there may be some sort of a structure here then you can see that there is a contention between the seed and then rebecca inquires something from the lord that is in genesis chapter 25 when uh, jacob and esau fight inside Rebecca's womb and Rebecca says hey what is going on why should I live like this if you go to the other end you will see that there is contention between the seed of uh, Isaac there the same two brothers and uh, again Rebecca has an inquiry Esau plans to kill Jacob and uh, Rebecca plans an escape for him and then she goes to Isaac and she says if Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth what good will my life be to me that obviously parallels a sentence from the previous section then Yahweh says something to Rebekah. Two nations are in thy womb. The elder shall serve the younger. That's on the first side of the chiasm. On the second side, Isaac says to Esau, I have made your brother your Lord and all his brethren his servants. Again, the same concept 
of uh, who's the Lord, who's the servant. Then, the two twins, the twins are born, and the younger holds his brother's heel. You know the story. Jacob holds the heel of his brother Esau when he is born. And that's why he is called actually Jacob. Right? On the other side of the chiasm, it is pointed out that uh, Jacob is called or is named the way he is named because of that, because of his character. For he had supplanted me twice, says Esau. So this deceitful nature of Jacob's character is emphasized. Back to the first side of the chiasm. Isaac prefers Esau, Rebecca prefers Jacob. Jacob does the trick and uh, the birthright now is his because Esau despises the birthright and gives it for what? For some stew or some lentil soup. On the other side, however, you see again that Isaac prefers Esau, Rebekah prefers Jacob. Jacob gains the blessing and now Esau is in tears. He wants his blessing too. What is interesting to notice is that there is a difference between the birthright and the blessing. One is on one side, the other one is on the other side. Then, on the first side of the chiasm, Isaac goes to Abimelech because there's a famine in the land. On the other side, Abimelech comes to Isaac when the Lord had blessed him. Then you have uh, the location where they live on one side, and then the location where they move on the other side. And little by little, it is obvious that the story comes down to this center piece here, where the story of Abraham is reloaded. What story? Go first to chapter 12. Chapter 12. Starting with verse 10. Now, there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. So beauty is the issue here. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you, that they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So it was when Abram came into Egypt, that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. Again, beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commanded her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? 
Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now therefore, here is your wife, take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Please remember that at one point we spoke about verse 19 where the NKJ says, I might have taken her as my wife. Some other translations say that Pharaoh actually took her as his wife. Now, the Hebrew text allows for both translations. But what we know here is that the problem is beauty. Abraham is afraid. So he comes up with a lie. Well, is that a lie, really? We don't know yet in this story. Then we go to chapter 20, and we have the second story of Abraham. Now this is Abraham, not Abraham, because in the meanwhile the name was changed. You remember that, right? And Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and stayed in Gerar. Gerar? Okay, that's the place, Gerar. Now Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. Same thing. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? So one of the major differences here is that we know Abimelech, although he had taken Sarah to the palace, he did not touch her. We don't have that certainty in the previous story. So at one point, God comes to Abimelech and speaks to him. And... Verse 4 says, but Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. For I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he's a prophet, and he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die you and all who are yours. So Abimelech rose early in the morning, called all the servants, and told all these things in their hearing, and the men were very much afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? How have I offended you that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. That Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you have in view that you have done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will kill me on account of my wife. But indeed, 
She is truly my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said to her, this is your kindness that you should do for me. In every place, wherever we go, say of me, he is my brother. And then Abimelech took sheep, oxen, and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham. And he restored Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, See, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. Then to Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you or covers you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus she was rebuked. So Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants. Then they bore children, for the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Now, what we know in this story, different from the previous, is that Sarah indeed was half-sister to Abraham, right? Same father, different mothers. So was what he said a lie? Well, technically, not really. Was it the truth, however? There you have some doubts. But with this in mind now, because we now have two Abrahamic stories, we jump to 26, chapter 26. There was a famine in the land. Have you heard about this before? Famine in the land? Of course. Beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham, and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Same place. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt, live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you, for to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Gerar is, if, say, Canaan is here, Gerar is here, all the way down, and Egypt is even more down, okay? So God tells him, don't go, don't go all the way down there where Abraham went the first time. Stop where Abraham was the second time, in the land of Gerar, the Philistines, and the king is Abimelech. Now, the question is, is this the same king Abimelech? It can be. But it may be more likely to be his son, because Abimelech, translated, means my father is king. So it was sort of a title. Like the Egyptians had Pharaoh, the title for the king, it seems that those in Gerar had Abimelech as a title for the king. So we don't know exactly. Probably this is the second Abimelech that is mentioned in the Bible. The name is very common. You will find it later in several different situations. Obviously not the same Abimelech. But the name is very common. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar, and the man of the place asked about his wife. And he said, she is my sister. <laughs> For he was afraid to say, she is my wife, because he thought, 
lest the man of the place kill me for Rebecca, because she is beautiful to behold. Oh, the same thing. Beautiful like in the first story of Sarah, when she was still Sarai. Remember in the second story of uh, Abraham, with she's my sister, her beauty is not mentioned. Sarah's beauty. So this story resembles well the first story of Abraham in some aspects because it revolves around beauty. But also the second story because it's in the same land with the same or the same dynasty of kings. The little chiasm you have in your worksheet focalizes in verse 8. And this is what 8 says. Now it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and saw, and there was Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife. Another good translation may be, he was caressing his wife. Now, there was some love going on there. From which Abimelech, the one that was planning on something, possibly, saw, hey, this lady is not his sister, she's his wife. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, quite obviously she's your wife. So how could you say she's my sister? Isaac said to him, because I said, lest I die on account of her. How well Isaac's reaction resembles Abraham's reaction. Same kind of fearful attitude. What if they kill me because of her? And Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? One of the people might soon have lain with your wife. Oh, there's another difference there. So it seems that he was not personally planning on anything. Or at least he covers that with the idea that somebody else could have done something. And you would have brought guilt on us. So Abimelech charged all his people saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. And then verse 11, so Abimelech, verse 12, then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous, for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. And they had filled them with earth. And the story goes on with fighting about the wells, the fountains, the water sources. And... Isaac has to move. He actually goes back to Beersheba, which is north from Gerar. A few observations, conclusions. Abraham, the friend of God, wasn't that perfect, immaculate guy. And you would expect that Isaac, his son, would not repeat some of his character traits, negative character traits, or some of his mistakes, some of the biggest mistakes. But that is not the case. Some of the character traits, negative traits that we see in Abraham, we can see in Isaac, like father, like son. 
some of his mistakes, we don't know if Isaac had any idea about his father's mistakes when it comes to the my sister story. But he did it too. And the way the narrative is told, it is calling your attention in a special way putting the reflector, the lights, on that story, because again, that's a chiasm from 25 to 28, as if highlighting, pointing out, hey, see what's happening here? This guy, the son of Abraham, is practically redoing the history, the story of his father, Abraham. I think it's beautiful in the text, and you can check this, Read on chapter 26, and you will see that before this happens, before this she's my sister story happens, God appears to Isaac as in preparation for something that may happen. And then when the story happens, after the story again, God appears to Isaac. What that tells me is that God graciously flanks, so to speak, Isaac's weakness with his assurance or confirmation of the promise of the covenant of the blessing that comes from Abraham and he's the carrier of. Questions? Question is, in Abraham's stories, the one in Genesis 12 and then the one in Genesis 20, it appears that God inflicts or plagues the people, Pharaoh and his people, and then Abimelech and his people because of what they had done to Abraham. Is this God's direct intervention on his own account? Or is Abraham somehow asking for him? Now, for accuracy, I think it's important to clarify whether in Genesis chapter 12, we have indeed God inflicting any kind of uh, plague on uh, the Egyptians. So verse 17 says, But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's, Abraham's wife. Correct. So we have, we have the plagues mentioned here. We don't know exactly what it is. We don't know what that looked like. Now in the second story, we know something specific about what happened to them. So that's chapter 20. The last verse in chapter 20 says, For the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So God's intervention in this second story is um, that the women in Abimelech's house and his kingdom could not conceive. Did Abraham have any role in this? I don't see in the text any evidence that Abraham asked God to do something against them. That does not mean he could have not spoken with God about it. But in both stories, we see God intervening. And uh, in the second story, the one with Abimelech, I think the way God intervenes, it says, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, indeed, you are a dead man because of a woman whom you have taken for she is a man's wife. That's a pretty scary intervention, I would say. <laughs> That's why Abimelech says, hey, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? So Abimelech has some sort of uh, knowledge about God 
and some expectations with regard to God. He would not expect that God would destroy a righteous, or whatever he calls righteous, nation because of something that they are not guilty of. Interestingly, Abraham then explains to Abimelech that that's exactly why he misled them, why he deceived them. Abraham said, verse 11, because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place. Was the fear of God in that place? It was. God even spoke with some people there. So whenever we think God only speaks to Seventh-day Adventists and Christians, we should review, revise that kind of mentality. God works with different people in different places. Of course, there was a different kind of interaction between Abraham and God, but God spoke with these people too. So to your question, I don't see in the text that Abraham was asking for God to hit those people. I don't see it in the text. But I see God acting. It's like when something terrible happens, law enforcement takes action. So the question is, how is it that God allows, in the case of Abraham and Sarah, to get married, so brother and sister, half brother and sister, when later on in Leviticus, for instance, chapter 18, you have uh, very detailed uh, prescriptions as to what is and what is not allowed for marriage when it comes to family relationships. We don't have a very clear answer to that. But what we can infer from the story of the Bible is that from the beginning, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like in Leviticus chapter 18. Because obviously, if Cain, who was the first son of Adam and Eve, had to get married at one point to procreate, he had to marry either a sister or a niece. There is no other possibility, really. It has to be somebody closely related from the family. Unless somebody postulates a different kind of creation. And this idea existed and still exists in Christianity. Some said, yeah, but God created multiple times. God created humans multiple times. He created Adam and Eve, and we have their story in the Bible. But God created some other humans as well in some other parts of the earth. And then the different stems of creation intermarried. We have no biblical account of anything like that. On the contrary, if you read Acts chapter 17, I think it's verse 30, it says that all came from the same blood, from Adam and Eve. I would say, based on the same blood. So, from the beginning, there had to be marriage between closely related, biologically related people. The same can be seen in Abraham's family. There was a lot of um, intermarrying in uh, Abraham's family. Abram and Sarai were half sisters. Then it's interesting to see how closely related Nahor and Milka were then uh, it's interesting to see that Isaac marries the daughter of a cousin. Then Jacob, in a similar way, goes back to the family of his father, mother. So there's a lot of intermarriage. But then in Leviticus, it's like God steps in and says, okay, let me give some specific instruction with regard to what is and what is not allowed. 
If I want to bring a scientific argument to that, although, again, I don't really want to base my Bible exegesis and hermeneutics or interpretation on what we think is science, because then we read back into the Bible. Because what we know as science today was not necessarily science as they understood at that time. Today we would say, well, the reason why God intervened and gave some specific instructions is that if you marry somebody closely related, then the likelihood of sickness increases exponentially, which, from what I gather, may be true. Although even today, there are societies where intermarriage of closely related family is still a practice. Now, if that's good or not, from a biblical perspective, obviously God gives specific instructions what is and what is not allowed. But that comes later. So I perceive some sort of a progression from a certain kind of situation toward a different kind of situation. And along the way, God intervenes and clarifies things, what is and what is not allowed to happen. That's the best way I can relate to it. That's another good question. How about keeping it in the family? There are cultures, there are societies today that are based on that concept. You don't want the wealth, the richness of the family go out, so you better stay in the family, marry in the family, keep it in the family, do everything in the family. Is that what the Bible wants to say? Again, this whole passage with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the rest of them, is a descriptive passage. It is not prescriptive. The difference? When it's descriptive, God tells you just what happened with good and bad. And then from the text, based on some hints, some indications of the text, you can conclude whether something was good or bad in that certain context. When it's prescriptive, then you know God wants you, you and you and me to do that. From what I can gather, Abraham's, Isaac's, Jacob's story are descriptive realities. So in order for us to be able to say, yes, God wants for the wealth to stay in the family, or God wants family members to marry among themselves, for that I should be able to find something in a prescriptive passage of the Bible which I think will be hard to find. We would be hard-pressed to find something that prescribes that reality. Now, is there wisdom in staying within the same culture in which you were born, raised, and uh, in which you fully developed as an adult? instead of uh, going for another culture? I would say probably yes, because marriage is not something very easy, not even within the same culture, let alone if you go way out of your own culture and you have to learn and relearn things. But is it forbidden to do that? No, it's not. Is that something you should embark on on your own? No. I think what we can take from Abraham's, Isaac's, Jacob's, and then the rest of them story is that uh, this marriage thing can be tricky, can be complicated, and you better have it done with God making the arrangements somehow. You don't want to, to do 
these kind of things outside of God's plan. You are speaking about 26 verse 10. And Abimelech said, what is this you have done to us? Very similar to what Abimelech said to Abraham. What was in your mind when you did this to us? One of the people might soon have lain with your wife and you would have brought guilt on us. Guilt. Whatever was guilt or the conception, the, um, the idea of guilt in that society. So the question is, how did Abimelech know that God was going to do something hard, bad to them? Was that the question? This is what I would point out here. Every society has norms of morality. In Abimelech's society, in Abimelech's culture, it seems that if you know somebody is somebody's wife, you would not go after that woman. You would leave that woman alone. That's what I see in the story. Actually, that comes across in all three of these stories. Both Pharaoh and Abimelech 1 and then Abimelech 2, they react the same way. For them, this idea of knowing that somebody is married to somebody, somebody is somebody's wife, and then take that woman and make somebody else his wife was a very reprobable kind of deed, act. Now, if that's the case, because in all three stories there is the case, the narrative brings it out. The narrative tells us society, those societies are not that corrupt. Yes, they have their problems, they have their sins, they have their lawlessness going on there. But when it comes to family, when it comes to respecting the family relationship of a husband and wife, they really keep that in account. And there you have Abraham and Isaac misreading their own culture. Well, a culture in which they are still newcomers to some degree. Right? Because Abraham came from uh, Mesopotamia, lived for a while in uh, Haran, which is up north, and then he came down. But it seems that both Abraham and Isaac, and Abraham even admits it in his conversation with Abimelech, has this conception, man, there is no fear of God in this place. And when the man of God reflects that kind of mentality back on society, you have some problems. And I would say we should, or we can, if not should, take a lesson for ourselves, for our society. Because, hey, we have some spiritual pride sometimes that blinds us, and we have the impression everybody outside of the door outside of the entrance door of the church is corrupt to a degree where there's nothing good, nothing valuable, and um, there's no fear of God out there, which may not always be the case. And I believe in Abraham's case, when he was confronted by Abimelech, that comes across pretty potently that Abraham misjudged society, misjudged what would happen. But when you are fearful, that's what happens. Fear is uh, an incubator for all kind of monstrous ideas that we may reflect back on other people. 
and have the impression that everybody is against us, everybody hates us, everybody just wants to kill us, and we can develop a syndrome of martyrdom, when actually there are people out there and God tries to work with every single human being and every society. For instance, I was thinking about this fire that was happening the other day that affected some people's home. What do we know about these people? Little to nothing. You think God doesn't know anything about them? No, God knows them individually. And God spoke to them, God comforted them, God gave them wisdom. How good it would have been for God to have been able to have used us somehow in that process as well. Good, good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good observation. Let me repeat it. Throughout these stories, there's a pattern. There is a motive that comes back again and again. There is famine. So that triggers a crisis. Everybody goes in a crisis mode. You have to relocate. You have to move your family from a known place to an unknown place. That stirs fear. That triggers some reactions that you wouldn't even expect. But then one negative behavior, once it's, it's installed, can uh, bring another negative behavior in a similar context. And this is psychology here now. You've done this at one point. When the same context comes back, your default mechanism throws you back there. But then God is in control because the crisis passes. God intervenes. He works in spite of the weaknesses of those people. And the outcome, the blessing, how God restores, how God turns everything around is amazing. Because if you read on the story, yes, Isaac was blessed. His crops were multiplied. Even if he had to move from the region, no problem. God came back to him, see God, God, and reconfirmed that Isaac, you messed up. Just the way your father did it. I don't think God told him that, but that's how we would shape it. You are just like your father, man. <laughs> but God comes back to him and reconfirms, hey, Isaac, I'm still working with you. You are still mine. We are still walking together. We still have that plan. We're still moving forward. I have not abandoned you. When your faithfulness failed, my faithfulness was still there. And that is the whole story of the patriarchs. They're up and down, valley and mountaintop. And that's your story and my story. Lord, we thank you so much for the history of uh, the people of faith, people of faithfulness. And beyond their faithfulness, we thank you for your faithfulness in their life and in our life. In Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit, amen.